evening. I hope your eyes are on the Lord tonight. I love that song, one of my favorites. We need that reminder, don't we? Keep our eyes on the Lord, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. Mark chapter 6 this evening. Mark chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 7 through 13. Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, in what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for another chance to get together. I thank you for all those that came out tonight. And Lord, as we always do when we meet, Lord, we're coming to ask you to do a work in our hearts, to challenge us, to use your word. Lord, thank you that your word does not return void, but it accomplishes the thing that you sent it to do. So, Lord, challenge and encourage us tonight through your word. In your name I pray. Amen. So far in this book, we've seen a wonderful, gradual unfolding of the, of the power and authority that Jesus has. And as we've gone through the book, we've seen more and more proof of Jesus' divine messiahship. And we've also seen that at certain times people have doubted him. Remember, his family said that he was crazy. The Jews attributed his power to Satan. But he continued to reveal that he's able and that he has the authority to perform amazing miracles. And uh, just to remind you of a few, remember he he calmed the storm, and he proved that he had the power over nature. He could control the weather. We saw him casting out demons, healing the sick, and raising the dead. It's been pretty awesome, hasn't it, to see God, to see Christ reveal himself as God, reveal himself as the Messiah through this book. What we have today is a passage that is further proof of Christ's divinity. Now, you may get focused on the disciples here. And we're going to talk up through the passage. But I believe what, what this really is, is this is showing that Christ has even a higher level of power and authority in that he's able to transfer his power to his disciples. Now, it's one thing to be good at something, but it's another thing to be so good that you can help other people be good, right? That's even greater power. And what we see here is that Christ has these miraculous powers and he's able to transfer that authority and that power to his disciples and they are able to perform miracles. Now, I want to say, I don't believe that this passage that we read, this story, is prescriptive in that I don't think this is some type of commandments that we are to follow in the future. I believe this was a unique situation that Christ sent out his disciples to further the good news of the gospel and the good news of his messiahship. I do, however, believe that there is a foreshadowing here because this is the first time that we're going to see people carrying out Christ's ministry. And I believe what's going on here is we're getting a little foreshadowing of the fact that after Christ's ascension, that his followers were going to continue his ministry, you and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to focus on this evening on some principles that we can see in this story, these principles that apply to us. And once again, I'll talk 
more through the passage. But let's look, if you're taking notes, at three truths about continuing Christ's ministry. Three truths about continuing Christ's ministry. The first thing we're going to see is Christ is able to empower his followers. Christ is able to empower his followers. Let's look again at verses 7 through 10. It says, And he called unto them the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. It'd be really easy just to just read through that verse. This is, <laughs> this is unbelievable, okay? Jesus is sending them forth, and he's saying, Hey, you are going to be able to cast out demons. Verse 8, verse Yeah, verse 8, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. He's saying to his disciples, hey, don't pack a bunch of clothes. I don't know about you, when I travel, I tend to bring too much stuff. How many of you are like that? Some of you don't bring enough. I tend to bring too much. Jesus tells his disciples here, I don't want you to worry about stuff. You're going to go just like Jesus did, right? Jesus traveled. He didn't have a lot of possessions. We don't have any record of Jesus, you know, having a a camel full of of his belongings. He just went and and God provided for him. And that's what he's telling the disciples to do. Verse 10. And he said, said unto them, wait a second. Yeah. And he said unto them, in whatsoever, in place... Ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. So this is, this is amazing that Christ has been revealing his power. He's been performing miracles. Some are doubting him. Some are believing on him. And we talked about the faith that people had, and they're, they're expressing that faith. And now he's sending forth his disciples, two by two, to minister, to continue his ministry. And he's giving them unique and special power. Now... I don't want to get into this question too much or spend too much time on it tonight. But I believe that if we study scripture, what you're going to find is that there are certain special gifts that uh, are sometimes referred to as sign gifts. And these include um, uh, speaking in tongues, casting out demons, and also healing people. And if you study scripture, what you see is that God imparted these abilities to to people, mostly the apostles, in a unique time. And the purpose of these these gifts were to authenticate new revelation. Now, there are a lot of Christians who believe that these gifts are still operable, that they can, you, we can still heal people, that we can still speak in tongues, we can still do these things. And although off, many of those people are our brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe that that is not the case biblically. I think if you study the context that these gifts were unique and they were special and they were designed to authenticate new revelation. And what do we have? We have the completed word of God now. Are you thankful that we have the word of God? What we see in church history is that once the word of God was created, was was completed, Scripture was written around the end of the first century. The church recorded that the sign gifts, the ability to heal these exorcisms and the speaking in tongues were slowly diminished in the church. And we can see that with the spread of the gospel as that new revelation saturated the known world. Those gifts went away. I'm saying all that because, again, I don't believe this passage is prescriptive for us. I don't believe that we are to be going out and, and doing what the disciples did and trying to heal people and cast out demons. But, but, I believe there is an important principle here, and that principle is still true today, that Christ is able to empower his followers, you and I. Let's think of some of the ways that God still empowers us. Number one, he empowers us by giving us spiritual gifts. Scripture teaches that every single one of us has a spiritual gift that God has given us uniquely to use in the local church. And you think about that, that is a gift from God, God's empowerment on our lives. 
Secondly, Scripture teaches that God empowers our witness. We see in Luke chapter 12 that Jesus promised his disciples that when they stood before in the synagogues and before people when they're facing persecution in different situations, that the Holy Spirit would give them the words to say. If, I, if you study that passage in Luke 12, I believe that that was not just to the disciples, but to all followers of Christ. That God would empower our witness when we stand up for him. Thirdly, God empowers us by giving us strength to do the everyday things that he has called us to do. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I don't believe that God uses these sign gifts the way he did in the New Testament. But I do believe that God is still working in us and through us and empowering us to do what he wants us to do. I think what's happened in sometimes in our circles, in Baptist circles, is that we've looked at the unbiblical nature of the charismatic movement. I'm talking about Church of God and Pentecostals and some of the unbiblical things they do. We have looked at that and we've kind of swung the, we've reacted to that and swung the pendulum the other direction and said and, and acted like the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything in our lives. You understand what I'm saying? To them, everything's the Holy Spirit. You know, everything is the Holy Spirit. Them, you know, they laugh in the Spirit. They do so much, and I don't think that's biblical. But I think in our circles, we've, we've kind of distanced the Holy Spirit from us to this abstract thing that just convicts us of sin and comforts us. And I believe biblically, the Holy Spirit is working in us and is empowering us and is helping us in our walk with God. God wants his children to develop a relationship with him where we are being empowered by his Holy Spirit. That requires us to walk with God, to seek his will, to keep a close relationship with the Father. And then to, as the Spirit says, as as Scripture says, to walk in the Spirit. And then God has promised that he will help us, he will empower us. I can think of many instances in my life where God empowered me through the Holy Spirit to do things that I could not do otherwise. I was thinking about some of my seminary experiences. And I know some of Pastor Snyder knows, and some of you have been to Bible college, but seminary is hard. I can tell you the Marine Corps was nothing compared to seminary, okay? I would go do Marine Corps boot camp for five years straight over seminary. Seminary is hard. And I remember many times in seminary when things would happen, and it was, I was just, it was so difficult. I remember some Fridays where I, I would make a list of everything I had to get done by Monday, and I would look at it, and I would literally think, it's going to take an act of God for me to get this all done. And I would just go, and I could text Misty, please pray for me. I have so much to do, which is a very common text I would send her. And, I would pray, Lord, please help me. I don't see how I can get this done. I have so much going on. There's no way. And I would just start working hard. And I would feel God giving me strength and helping me to get through. I remember one particular incident. I had a big assignment due at midnight. We would submit our assignments online. It was a 12-page Greek paper that I worked on for about two weeks. I went to submit it. It was five minutes till midnight. I went to submit the assignment. And when I did, it was gone. The computer glitched. I had been saving the assignment, but it was saving it on a cloud with the school, but my computer was not connected to the cloud. I completely lost the entire assignment. After crying for about 10 minutes, (laughs) I emailed my professor and told him what happened. He was very gracious, and he said, just get it done as fast as you can. I... It was honestly one of the lowest parts of the whole time there. I was so discouraged. I had worked so hard. I just prayed God help me. And I remember the next day I sat down to start this thing again. And I remember God helping me. And you know what? In one day, in about 12 hours, I sat down. I completed that whole assignment. Now, some of it was up here. I would already done the work, right? But I really depended on the Lord. And you know what? I got an A on it. That, and I said, thank you, Lord. 
I, I, that was really an act of God. But I can think about in my own life, and, and you can't relate with that too much because that's my experience. But I, I remember struggling and seeking God's help. And then I remember looking back and saying, God helped me. I, I think about that with preaching. There's been instances, even in the last year, where I was fearful or struggling. And I say, Lord, please help me with this. And I stand up at this pulpit, and I can feel God helping me. God empowers his children. This is nothing special to me. I'm not special. He does this for all of his children. I'm confident that many of you can, could share experiences where you prayed and asked for strength or help or wisdom and God helped you. God delights in helping us and, and strengthening us to accomplish what he has asked us to do. If we'll walk with him and we'll depend on him. Some of you have children or grandchildren who are away from the Lord, and some of them are even hostile to the things of God. Maybe you're going to get a chance to see them, and you don't know what to say. I want to encourage you, go to God. That's a heavy burden, isn't it? Go to God and say, Lord, what do you want me to say? And the Lord will help you. Maybe you have an unsaved coworker that the Lord's put on your heart that you're burdened about, and you don't know what to say or how to witness to them. Go to God and say, Lord, help me, and he will help you. Maybe you have a family member that's unsaved, and they're really hard to be around. They're really hard to love. They're really hard to, to be Christ-like towards. Go to God and ask him to help you, and he can help you to respond right and, and to be Christ-like with that person. The point is, God does empower us. He may not help you cast out a demon or heal somebody, but he's still helping us and empowering us to serve him. Let's see the second truth from this passage we're going to see in verse 11, is that Christ's followers will share his opposition. Christ's followers will share his opposition. Look at verse 11. It says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet, for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Christ says, if you go there and they don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet, we'll talk about that in a second, and just move on and I will deal with them. I really believe that many Christians, we live in a fantasy world that we try to convince ourselves that we can live for Christ and follow Christ and still have the respect and love of the world. Folks, if you're going to love for Christ, you're going to have opposition. Some people in this world are not going to like you. They're not going to treat you well. They're not going to love you or respect you. That is the reality. Now, it's possible in individual cases that you may have a lost friend that you have a good, healthy relationship with, and that, that does happen, and that's a good thing. But on a broader scale, you cannot live for God, faithfully proclaim the gospel without facing opposition. 1 John 3.13 says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. It's interesting here what Jesus tells them to do is to knock the dust off their feet. There is a lot of disagreement among the scholars on what this was for and what this meant and why they did this. There's a lot of theories, cultural context of what's going on here. I don't want to bog us down with the trying to figure out the exact idea here. The, the general principle is clear, is that he commanded them to do a, verbal, a, a visual sign that the, the city had rejected them had opposed their mission. And this is what I think we need to focus on that will encourage us tonight, is it says that after they do that, that God will deal with them. He doesn't say, okay, now you disciples, you go in there and you pay them back. If they're not going to listen to you, you run in there and you rough them up or you do this or you do that or you threaten them. No, you just identify these people rejected and move on with the ministry. And as Christians, when we face opposition, it is not our job to bring about punishment on those people. We can rest knowing that God is going to deal with them. 
If you have somebody at your workplace that is persecuting you because you're a believer, you don't have to punish them or teach them a lesson. God is going to deal with them. What we need to do is just not allow that opposition to keep us from ministering, to keep us from serving God. My dad's still pastoring, and, uh, and this summer he was asked by one of his church members to visit uh, their father that was in the hospital not doing too well. And the man was an unbeliever, and this was in Grand Rapids, so my dad went up to the hospital and spoke with the man and carried on a conversation and started sharing the gospel with him. Now, this room was one of the hospital rooms that has a divider, and there's two people in it. I hate those two people rooms. You know, that's kind of weird when you share a room. So my dad is speaking with this man, and the man he went to speak with was very cordial and friendly, and he didn't necessarily, you know, receive the gospel, but he was open to it. So him and my dad were having a good conversation, and suddenly behind the curtain there came some lady up to him, said, you need to leave right now. My dad says, excuse me? You need to leave right now. We don't want to hear this. It was the visitor of the patient that was in the same room next to on the other side of the curtain. My dad was kind of taken aback, and he said politely, well, ma'am, I'm not here to see you. I'm seeing this man, and, and I'm going to keep talking with him. So they started carrying on a conversation. That woman went out and got the head nurse and complained, and that nurse came in and told my dad that he needed to leave the premises. All he was doing was sharing the gospel with this man, and he got kicked out of the hospital. Now, I don't know about you, but for some of me, I, I, would, have, I would have put up a fight. And that may not have been wrong to do because, you know, we do have something in this country called the First Amendment, right? That was wrong. That was illegal, actually, what they did. And he would, my, my dad would have been fine to fight it, but his mentality was, you know what? I'm not going to cause a stir. I'm not going to cause a problem. I'm just going to head home. He finished the conversation and left. But the point is this. If we are there proclaiming the gospel, if we're serving God, if we're doing what God wants us to do, we're going to face opposition. And then we have to decide what to do with it. Jesus told his disciples here, shake the dust off your feet. I think there's something symbolic there, personally. Shake the dust, to leave it there, to let it go. Do a, just say, identify this, these people aren't having it. Let it go and move on and minister somewhere else. I think we need to stop worrying about what the world does to us and focus on obeying God and serving him. And when opposition comes, we should move on and let God take care of it because he will. God will take care of those that oppose his servants. Let's see the third thing we're going to see. This third truth we're going to see in verses 12 through 13. Christ's followers must continue his message. Look at verse 12. It says, and they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Number three tonight, Christ's followers must continue his message. It's interesting, it tells us plainly what their main topic of the sermons they preached were. What did they preach about? Repentance. Why did they do that? What had Jesus been preaching about? Repentance. This was the primary message, was they were calling people to repent of their sin. This is part of the gospel message, is this idea of repentance. This idea, this principle of repentance, has been terribly treated in our culture right now. There's two different ways that, that we, as the ch American church, have really struggled with this area. First of all, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are a bunch of Baptist churches in the U.S. that claim that repentance has nothing to do with salvation. Did you know that? There's a new movement within the Baptist church that says that repentance is a work and that that has no part in salvation. Salvation is by faith alone. We don't need to repent of our sins. That is completely unbiblical. Repentance is not a work. It's, it's not an act. It is a mind and heart matter. 
Repentance is simple. It's recognizing you're a sinner. It's saying, I am a sinner. And it's turning from that. I want to turn away from my sin and turn to God. There's another group in our country, and they haven't come out against repentance, but I would say the broader evangelical churches in our nation, very few of them are preaching about repentance. Very few. It's not that they've doctrinally said that repentance isn't important. It's that they have chosen not to talk about it. The reason they're choosing not to talk about it, because repentance is inherently offensive. To preach repentance is to say, guess what? You're a sinner. You have violated God's law. You are deserving of hell. And you need to turn from your sin. That is not a popular message. But it's an important message. It's very, very important. See, repentance is crucial because without repentance, there's no understanding of why you need a Savior. Why do you have to place your faith in Christ if you're a good person? So many people in our culture just believe that you just need to be a good person and you get to heaven. You know, just believe in God generically and you get to heaven and God's going to weigh your good and your bad. And if your good outweighs your bad, he'll let you into heaven. Even people that claim to be Christians believe that. That's not true. Scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have a perfect, holy, righteous God that cannot tolerate sin. And every single sin, no matter how big or how small, creates separation from us and God. And that's why we need a Savior. You cannot receive the good news of the gospel until you've embraced the bad news that you're a sinner going to hell. But because that part is offensive, many people and many churches have moved away from this term, have moved away from saying, repent and teaching repentance. They've moved to a Jesus loves you model of evangelism. Hey, Jesus loves you. Become his child. Now, is that true? Yes, Jesus does love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, what? Perish. God does love you, but he sent his son to die for you. Why? Because you are going to perish in your sin. And you cannot come to Jesus in faith until you recognize that you need a savior. The message of repentance is saying, hey, you are a sinner. Turn from your sin and turn and place your faith only in Jesus Christ. There's a temptation for us to water down or diminish or neglect this aspect of the gospel. There's a temptation to focus on the faith part and neglect to call people to repentance. But if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to continue Christ's ministry, Christ's ministry was one where he called for repentance. I can tell you that any place that calls himself a church that neglects repentance is not serving Christ. They're serving themselves And they should not be called a church. This doesn't mean that we have to beat people over the head or shame them in the gospel or be mean or excessively rude. I mean, I've been in churches like that. I've been in, in congregations where the pastor is just clubbing people from the pulpit. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being purposely, excessively offensive. I'm talking about sticking with the gospel And the gospel in itself is an offensive thing. You are a sinner. You need a savior. Repent from your sin. Acknowledge your sin and turn from it and turn to Christ as your savior. A person cannot truly get saved until they understand their sin and repent. That's not a work. It's a decision To believe what God's word has said about our condition and to believe what God's word has said about Christ and his work on the cross. I went to a funeral 
a few months back for a man that I believe was a lost man, and it was a very difficult funeral. The man had zero interest in church or spiritual things. I don't know his heart, but judging off his life, I don't believe he was saved. And I always preface that because we don't know people's heart and their past. I never assume 100%. But it seemed, based off his life, that this man was an unbeliever. And I was very sad when I got to the sermon part of the funeral. I wasn't preaching it. With a man that was preaching it, started talking all about how the man was in heaven. That made me sad. But what made me more sad is at the end, this pastor gave this watered-down, flimsy gospel message call, and it went something like this. He said, you know, sometimes we all make mistakes, and those mistakes, they cause a, a strain in our relationship with God. And I just want to encourage you to go to God and work those issues out. That was the extent of his gospel message. Now, let me tell you, that was a very kind message. It was very sweet, it was very nice, but it wasn't the gospel message. Now, I'm not saying at a funeral that he should have clubbed everybody over the head, but he didn't pre clearly present the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior. This is important for us because we are all tempted in our own witness, in our own co gospel conversations with people. We are tempted to water down or... or or add sugar, you know, try to sweeten up the message, try to dampen down the offensiveness. And we need to be very careful. Because if we're following Christ, if we're continuing Christ's ministry, we need to be proclaiming that salvation comes through repentance and faith. People need to recognize their sin. We don't need to be purposefully offensive, but if we're going to be bold with the gospel, we have to be willing to offend people with the truth. I just want to challenge us tonight to assess your own gospel witness. If you're passing out tracks, I hope you are. This is just kind of a side plug, but we have tons of tracks in the back that are free for you to take. And we've tried to read there. I think they're mostly all good tracks, but if you're passing out tracks, read your tracks, make sure they're good. Make sure they're preaching the gospel, that they're, they're biblical. If you're having conversations with church, pe with, with lost people, do your best. And obviously you can't just, you know, you meet somebody and you're, hey, my name's Isaac. Repent of your sins and get saved. It's not very effective, is it? I'm not saying we need to talk like that. But I am asking us, when we're proclaiming the gospel to people, are we doing it faithfully? The true gospel, the good news of the gospel, and the bad news of why we need the gospel, because people are sinners. That's what he says here, is that they went out and they preached repentance. So as we close tonight, I want to ask us some questions to assess. Four things I want us to think about as we wrap up. Number one, are you serving Christ with your life? This whole message is about if you're serving Christ, if we're following Christ, if we're continuing Christ's ministry through the Holy Spirit, I just ask, are you doing that? It is completely possible that there's some here tonight on Super Bowl Sunday that you go to church faithfully, that you're saved, but if you're honest with your life is not really serving God, you're not really ministering, you're not really walking with God, you're not really doing what God wants you to do in your life. So I want to start with that. These have been details about how we can further Christ's ministry. But first, I just want to ask, are you even trying to do that? I'm thankful that many, many, many of you are, but something for us to assess tonight. Number two, are you seeking God's power and help? You know what's funny as Christians is we, God gives us something to do, and then we turn around and try to do it on our own strength. <laughs> God will give us a new ministry or bring somebody in our life that needs encouragement or he'll bring someone that needs to be witnessed to and then we just try to do it without asking God for help. That's not what God designed. God wants us to depend on him and he will strengthen us, empower us. So are you seeking God's power and help? Number three, are you willing to face opposition? 
Are you willing to be a testimony even if your neighbors, your family, your coworkers are opposed to you? Because opposition will come. Number four, are you faithfully proclaiming the true gospel, calling people to recognize their sin and place their faith in Christ? I'm thankful that God is so powerful that he can empower us to serve him, that he's involved in our lives, and that if we walk with him, that he's going to help us. And he is powerful enough. He's not just doing miracles on his own. He's powerful enough to do a work in our lives and do a work through us to accomplish his will. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you're working in us, Father. Lord, your word says that without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, every person in this room that is saved, Lord, your Holy Spirit is inside of them. And Lord, you desire to use us. There's so many different things and different ways you want to use us, but you want to use us for your glory. Lord, help us to be useful. Lord, help us to seek your power and your help. Lord, please empower us to do the things we need to do in our homes, in our church, with the people around us. Lord, help us to accept the reality that we're going to face opposition. Lord, some of us really have a strong desire to be liked and loved and respected by people, and we're fearful of men. Help us, Lord, to fear less about men and care more about what you want. And Lord, help us to proclaim your word faithfully. Lord, help us not to sugarcoat the gospel, but to just lovingly present the truth. Lord, we're tempted to water it down. We're tempted to soften the blow of the truth. Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to be bold and loving and consistently preaching the message of your word. Lord, do a work in our hearts. In your name I pray, amen.